Good morning. It is 2 p.m. Oh, no, it's noon. High noon here on a Thursday. I am on in in this uh, very beautiful sunny San Diego day where I got my my blinds are down because we get the morning set in the room. Well, we have quite a show today about a loan officer uh, who will be joining us who's created his own platform, uh, was out there originating and, and seeing the trends of if you have a following, big or small, it's more likely to be able to lead to opportunity. And I think that's what he's going to get into, uh, which I posted on it last night, Mike. I've had more and more opportunities from us doing the show. And I don't know, what would be the analogy? I guess people naturally go to like working out, but all of a sudden it's been 52 weeks, right? Like we started last June, we're, we're past 52 straight weeks. When we started, I can see why they say like 99% of, podcast don't get past seven the seventh episode that um i think i had done a couple in my the mobile patio i think got to like seven to ten and i didn't keep it up so it's on all of a sudden now you're seeing the results and it, it might you know whether it's in impressions views or just the people reaching out in opportunity and i and i you know mike's going to get into that today i'm sure but i'm sure you're seeing it too and I guess we should use this to encourage others to do what we did. I think that, uh, it, you know, it, <laughs> you, you don't know what you don't know. And it's like, even if, you know, let's say you go to seven to 10 episodes and you've been doing it uh, once a month, you're like, well, we've been doing it for a year because we've been doing it every month and we don't really see any results. So I guess, I guess we better stop pouring money into something that doesn't work. And I think it it's, it's just something that you got to sit there and, and be more consistent on, right? The consistency of kind of like, well, how many phone calls are you going to make? How many emails are you going to send? Uh, or even the other way around, how many emails do you send before you get to the phone call? And then how many phone calls do you make before you actually show up on somebody's door to to go, to go chase after either the lead, the referral source, or or what does it take to, you know, even if, or if you have the deal going on, to go close the deal to meet them in person. And I think that, it goes to show uh, how much we need to be able to, as salespeople, and for our listeners and our and our viewers that are out there, how much, um, if you are in sales, how much consistency uh, you need to bring. And this is just one aspect in our podcast and our show. Not just not just showing up for the show, but how you do anything is how you do everything. So we don't just do this for our show. We're also doing this in our email campaigns. We're doing this in our LinkedIn follow-up in our email follow-up in our telephone follow-up and then in the work in the background work that we do when michael and i are talking at for him at one o'clock in the morning and me at 10 o'clock at night in our follow-up before the show and sometimes on the weekends and i think that these are just things that even if you may not see behind the scenes but we but we do it and i know that uh, for our viewers and our listeners that are out there they also uh if they are doing it then they may be seeing some results. And if you don't see the results yet, you just need to, to stick to it. You're only five feet from gold. And I think you need to, to be able to continue. We talked about that last night a little bit, Mike, five feet from gold. Just keep on doing it so that you can see the results. Yeah, Mike Mills, who's joining us today, is going to show us that you can do both. It's not one or the other. So we're going to bring him here into the studio and he's going to talk. You can be a producing loan officer. And you can do the podcast piece for, as I talked about in the beginning, to diversify and build a platform. Because Mike talked about when I spoke with him, Mike Mills. Wow, this is really mic'd up. We're going to have three mics. Uh, We're over mics. We're over mics here. <laughs> in all of our prepping, it never occurred to me we were going to have three mics on a mic'd up show. So you throw it in my face, though, and now and now it's very obvious. Yes, uh, yes, we are super mic'd. And, and by the way, I want to apologize for being tardy to our event. I uh, um, I didn't realize we were starting right on time, and then I had just wrapped up my podcast that I just did, so I was, like, finishing that, and I looked down, I was like, oh, crap. And then I got here, I was like, oh, maybe we'd have a few minutes, but like, no, man, we're going, so let's go. I'm good. I'm ready to go, though. Yeah, we're right into it, and we are we're live on LinkedIn. We're live on youtube but what, what we really do this for is for our podcast so if you're listening on spotify on youtube on apple please give it a like a follow recommend it that this is where we are really trying to add value mike i was going to tell your origin story but you might as well 
tell it um, how you understood as a loan officer building an audience and then choosing podcast. And I think we also want to touch on like you went from local to more of a national and you want to talk about what changed in, in that mindset too so that others can learn um, how to get to where you are and how it can happen overnight. I'm still climbing the mountain, but, uh, but thank you for that. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, so I've been a, uh, a loan officer, you know, producing loan officer for almost 15 years. Um, been doing this for a little bit. And, um, it's one of those things where when I, uh, started doing mortgages, you know, it was just, it, it was like a call center deal. I'm, I'm on the phone talking to folks, you know, trying to get leads, that kind of thing. And, um, and then I moved into the retail world, which is like, you have to go out and get your own business. So you have to actually be the one that's out there, you know, meeting agents and, and getting, you know, creating relationships and doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I did that for a very long time as well. And, and really, you know, uh, got pretty good. I can, I can talk to people and, and love having conversations with folks and love meeting people and finding out about them and all that kind of stuff. So, so that worked out, you know, pretty well for a long time. And, and then we got to the world in 2020 and 2021, uh, where business just exploded, right? Money's incredibly cheap. Um, everybody was out there just, you know, making great money, selling real estate, doing mortgages, title. And if you were in and around real estate for the last, you know, for those two or three years, you were killing it. Everybody was, and you didn't have to do anything. Like really, you could just sit at your house and your phone would ring and people knew what you did. Well, just like anything else, when I got into, when I was doing leads, when I was, it was during the refi time, this was like 2007, 2008, um, rates were low. Well, I knew rates were going to go up and I knew I had to get out of just doing refinances and moving into purchases. So that's why I switched over to retail because I knew that low rate environment wouldn't last. I needed to get my chops at doing purchase business. So I started doing that. Well, after rates went down again and we got into a ton of refinances, we were still doing purchases, actually primarily doing purchases still. Um, I knew that when rates went back up, which they would, cause that's what they do that it wasn't going to be, you could just sit around and do nothing. Like you had to find a new way to do it. And then when we add into all of this, the advent of technology, where now you have social media, now AI is creeping in, you know, the way that lending is handled in general, because I think things like blockchain and, and, not, and I'm not talking about crypto, but just, just all of the financial tools that are going to start to adjust how we do stuff in our industry. I knew I needed to find another route to start being able to put myself out there and get more and more business because you know, um, I didn't anticipate it was going to happen like this, where, you know, we're literally, I read an article yesterday. This is the, in the last 25 years, this is the most, or, you know, depressed or whatever you want to call it time for mortgages that we've seen in 25 years. Like we're doing fewer mortgages now than we've ever done in 25 years, even, you know, worse than real estate because you got new homes and things like that that are still coming up. But so it's one of those things where, you know, I knew there had to be something that I needed to add to my arsenal. Well, one of the things, as you can tell, that I like to do is talk. I love talking to people. I love, you know, having conversations. I'm not a, it's funny because I'm, I'm not a small talk dude. Like if you put me in a networking group where there's like 25 people that are all trying to sell their own crap, like I'm not that you, you're going to, I'm going to go find one guy or gal and I'm going to go talk to them as long as I can, because I don't want to talk about the weather and you know, how your kids are like, I'm just not interested. It, you don't do, I, how are you at uh, high school reunions then? Cause it's the same question 20 straight times. Yeah. That one's a little different. Cause then at least it's like you remember and you want to, but still then I would rather talk to one person for an hour than I would to talk to 20 people for five minutes. Like that's just not because you just find out so much more about them and you learn so much because when you have conversations with people, that's when you grow your own knowledge base, because there's always, I, I strongly believe that every single person you talk to, it doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what they do, their level of intelligence, none of that matters. Every single person you talk to, you can learn something from, right? Whether it's what to do, what not to do, you know, where they came from, you know, it's like even that asshole that you meet, for no custom on this, but even that jerk that you meet that is, is, you know, like the biggest whatever, when you find out who their parents were, where they came from, what their life was like, you start to understand, okay, now I see why you are the way that you are. And, and, and that's a learning experience and that's something that you can pick up. So that's something that I've always wanted, that I've always liked. Like, this isn't something that is like a new thing that I've developed. This has just been my entire life. But so when it comes to marketing, right. And this is, this is something I talk with agents about. These are things that I've done my show about 
marketing is something that everybody, there's no secret tricks to this stuff, right? You, the, there's leads that you can get. There's videos you can make. There's, you know, bus stop signs, whatever, whatever you want to do. But the key to marketing is finding something that you like to do and that you will do consistently. Okay. That you, you will do all the time. Because if you're, I always use the example of leads, like realtors, especially when we talk about this, I say, okay, they're like, well, I'm going to get Zillow leads or I'm going to pay this thing to do leads. I'm like, that's fine. There's plenty of people that make a lot of money taking online leads. However, do you like calling random strangers on the phone 30 times a day and sending text messages and sending emails? Do you have a process to do this? Are you very system oriented? Are you very detail oriented? Because if you're not, then you're going to be wasting your money buying leads because unless you're that person, which there are plenty of people out there like that, you're not going to have success with that model because that's not you, right? So you have to find what am I good at? What do I do well? And then what will I stay consistent with? Well, I listen to podcasts all the time. I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. I listen to Lex Friedman. I listen, my favorite podcast right now is the All In podcast. I don't know if you guys know that one, but all of this about money and investing, these are all like angel investor guys are, it's awesome to listen to. Um, I'm into politics. I'm into, you know, all of this stuff. So I listen, I go outside every Saturday and I work, I have like three acres in my house and I mow, I edge, I do yard work. And the whole time I'm listening to podcasts. Like that's what I do. Um, when I'm working out, I'm listening to podcasts. When I'm walking, I'm listening to podcasts. That's just what I do. I enjoy it. So I always thought, man, I'd like to, I'd like to do this because I like to talk. I like to meet people. So I want to do podcasts. So that's what I did. I decided, okay, I'm going to do it. So my very first podcast, I called a buddy of mine who was, uh, he was a roofer. His name's Cody Durham. Shout out to Cody. Um, great roofer in Dallas, Fort Worth. So 10 gauge Ridge roofing, give him a call. He's awesome. Um, I said, Hey Cody, I need a favor. I need you to come to my office. It sounds crazy. I want you to sit down with me. I'm going to record us and we're going to talk and I'm going to interview you and talk about roofing as it relates to real estate, right? Because if, if I'm going to do something, I need it to benefit my business somehow, right? You know, I mean, otherwise it's, it's a waste of time or it's not a waste of time, but you know, what I mean. so um, he came in, we sat down, we talked, you know, I interviewed him. We were sitting in front of a green screen. You know, I, I had some questions prepared. I recorded it and then I kind of went back and edited it a little bit and then I posted it and, you know, just kind of trial and error. Right. And then I brought in another guy to sit down with me a couple of weeks later, reached out to a broker that I knew, brought him in and talked to me and just asked him questions about what they do. So then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to use this podcast avenue initially to interview realtors, right? Because it's a way for me as a mortgage lender to meet agents that I don't know, right? Obviously the people that I do know, I bring them in because they've been sending me business and I want to reciprocate. And then I could take those at least, you know, there, again, there's an idea between what I want to do and what I actually did, but I wanted to take all of those and clip them up, you know, cause at that time, social media was still, this was a couple of years ago and then use them to say, okay, you can post this as a reel. So now I'm giving them value, right? You're coming to talk to me. You're spending an hour speaking to me. I'm going to take these, this interview and I'm going to cut it up into pieces and I'm going to post it on YouTube. I'm going to post it on Facebook. I'm going to tag you. So now this is a way for you to promote yourself to your clients. And here's the cool thing about podcasts. It doesn't matter if there's six people watching. It doesn't make any difference. When you have a clip of a person with headphones on, with a microphone, and they're talking about their expertise, okay, you've put them in this this image of being, hey, this person knows what they're saying. It gives them like credibility. It's almost like you're not writing a book, but you know how when people say, hey, if you write a book, whether if anybody reads it or not, you can be like, hey, I'm an author, right? So it's kind of the same idea. If you put a microphone and headphones, they're being interviewed, they're asked their opinions. This puts them in a light of being an expert in that particular topic. So it's a benefit for them and it's a benefit for me. So it's you know mutually beneficial in this thing. So I did that for a while. Now, what I will tell you, here's what I found out. The people that I worked with that were already my agents, they loved it. They appreciated it. You know, we, we were stronger bonded, more time to spend together. Cause you know, again, I, I don't like, uh, you know, just hanging out and going to lunch and you know, I'm, I'm just not a small talking guy, but this was the chance for me to really get to know my like partner. When you really say that, are you saying in the moment of recording or the preparing the recording? the clips after it, it constantly and, and then talking about how good the show was like, what is the lasting effect um, of that intimate relationship around the podcast? Is it hours, days or, or a month or more? Well, for people that I was already working with, I'd already established the relationship with, then it was just an extra, another level to it. Right. So it just, 
it just bonded them to you even more because now I'm spending an hour really spending time and talking to them and asking them questions, not to mention the lead up before and after and sharing the clip. So, you know, the thing about any kind of sales is the more touches you can get with your clients, the better, right? Because if you can contact and speak to your clients as much as possible, then that's going to develop a stronger relationship with you and them. So when it's time to refer out their next deal or do whatever, they're going to think of you first before they think of everybody else, right? So, so that's the concept behind it is this gives me a chance to have a stronger relationship. Yeah. Marketing has gone, I'm diving really deep into AI in marketing, specifically clay. If anyone wants to call me out, I spent a hundred hours on clay in the last two months. And if there is anybody in real estate or mortgage on clay, DM me. Um, I would love to brainstorm, but so it's gone from like inbound and outbound, which you said, like, obviously outbound is not the most enjoyable thing in the world. Cause it requires some cold calls and some leads and, and right. But now it's like all bound and it's intent based marketing. And if you can create intent triggers, do it in the way that you're saying is the most enjoyable to you. And if that means that you don't mind talking and getting in front of a mic, which by the way, you could reach out to any of the mics on here. We'll, we'll help you. I don't know if we all like, but that's speaking on for you, Mike, but you just have a big heart. Um, so, well, and then the other avenue to this was that I also thought, okay, I thought, well, I can also reach out to agents that I don't know. Like this is a good avenue for me to introduce myself to new people and create something there, right? And then in my mind, I'm like, okay, I can reach out to these people, I can make a relationship, and if they have a decent audience on a certain platform, so like I would search through Instagram or I would search through TikTok or any of the platforms and I would find agents that were local that I could physically meet, right? Not necessarily someone that was like in Austin or Houston that I would have to do online because it's a little harder, but I would physically bring them into my studio and then meet them and then we would have a conversation and I'm like, okay, this is going to be the relationship. Well, what I found out with that was that the people that already had a following, which were the most of the ones that I did, well, they were kind of at a place in their career or where they wanted to be that, um, that they didn't, not that they didn't need me, but it was hey, this is just another way for me to get my message out, which I totally understand. That was the reason I, I reached out to them. Um, but I also found that that relationship was much more difficult to try to create and maintain um, and, and try to get business and referrals off of because in the reality is, is that it, let's say that I've interviewed, I'm on like my episode now, I think I'm at 100 and almost at 150. I'm like 147 or something or 137 or something like that. But um, let's say that I've talked to 25 agents in that period, because I do some individual podcasts um, that I uh, that I didn't know, um, there might have been two of those that I've gotten like referrals from for for business. Okay, now the ones that I already worked with, and the ones that I have worked with in the past that even I didn't interview, just because they saw me online and they saw me talking to people and they they saw me on a regular basis, which this goes back to the you know frequency of marketing and advertising because they saw me all the time, they weren't necessarily trying to get on the show because, you know, a lot of them, they don't like, I don't want to be on camera. They don't want to talk, but I would get calls from someone that I hadn't worked with for six months who would say, Hey, I got a borrow. I want to send you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I saw your podcast. I think it's awesome. Thank you. You know, whatever. And so I found that what this started to do was my original intent was create better relationships with my agents that I already have and create new relationships with agents that I didn't, you know, work with. And the stronger relationships worked, but it also worked even if I didn't interview them, I could get them to come in or, I mean, I could create stronger bonds with them regardless because we would talk about the show or, or whatever. And then they saw me on a regular basis. And then the ones that I tried to go get that were new didn't really work out the way I wanted. And I'm sure like if I would have pushed harder and I'm not a, unfortunately, this is probably my downfall of sales. I'm not a, uh, you know, call them every week and, and ask them for business and that kind of guy. I just, you know, I probably need to be better at that, but I'm not good at that. So, um, so then what I decided to do was as I started gaining traction and, you know, you watch your stats every week and see how your, your views are going up. And most of my stuff comes from, uh, from audio. Um, I, I post this on YouTube. It's all on my social sites, but the vast majority of my listeners come from the audio side of things. Cause that's what I like. And that's what I tailor it to. Um, I started to notice that when I talked about 
bigger issues like, you know, I've been talking a lot about the NAR settlement and been talking a lot about, you know, um, just, just ways to market yourself with experts that do that kind of stuff, like social media experts and that kind of thing. Those episodes were getting much better traction than the ones where I was talking to a particular agent about what they did and how they did their business. Okay. They did okay, but they weren't doing as well as like the expert interview. So that's when I really started to shift and go, okay, I want to talk to people that are not necessarily realtors, but are around real estate where now it's a resource for agents to go to and listen and say, I want to learn about roofing. I want to learn about marketing. I want to learn about interest rates. I want to learn what's happening in the NAR settlement. I want to learn these things. And this is a place I can go to every week to pick that up. And that's where I started to shift to more national level. That was the question I've had is loan officer first starting purposefully goes after the realtors in their area really has to make that decision. Do I go with the realtors I have now and strengthen that relationship? Or do I go for new realtors to try and get more business? I think the obvious answer nowadays is probably find listings and use data providing software to find ones that are actually listing property. Um, then step two is as it progresses, you start to, now you start saying, I want to do something more national. And, and Mike and I kind of wrestle with this too. And so it's what you want to be. You start to struggle with like, who is your target audience for what you're selling to versus who you want to be seen as a podcaster in the future, right? And it's so like a curious one is I think you had Rob Chrisman on the show, show, right? Is that? I haven't had Rob yet. No. Um, I've had, uh, James Kleiman, who's the uh, managing editor for housing wire. I've had Lance Lambert, who is, he runs a uh, resi club. He was a uh, managing editor for Forbes, uh, for a number of years. I've got, uh, Dan Habib who is, um, he's coming up in the next couple of weeks. He is with, um, MBS highway, uh, Barry, I don't know if you know, he's, you know, he's got uh, cancer is going through chemo right now, but um, so Dan, his son is coming on. Uh, we're going to talk. So I've, I've taken more people that, that that are sources for other people in our industry that go to them for information and they have huge audiences. And those are the ones that I've been you know, aiming and trying to get. And also new technologies, because like you, AI to me, I think is going to complete, it already started has, but it's going to completely change how we do everything. And the more people I can talk to that are building platforms around AI, even if it's a little disruptive to what my audience who are realtors, you know, I'm like, hey, look, this is coming. You know, I had a lady, um, uh, Amanda Orson, who was on, uh, who runs a, uh, they've, they've created a, a web a website that is basically, you can list your house for sale. Um, it keeps transaction fees lows. It's driven by, you know, it's driven by AI to, to go in and put all this stuff together, but the cost is low. They connect buyers and sellers and there isn't a huge need for realtors in that environment. And they've designed the entire platform around that. Well, my audience is realtors. So that would kind of piss off a lot of people, but I'm, I'm taking the approach of, Hey, look, whether you like this or not, this is happening. So you need to be aware. And that's, that's what I try to do when I interview the people like that. Mike, one of the things I've noticed in listening to you and also uh, doing a little bit of research is that, uh, you're like, what's that saying? Like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And you're like six degrees of separation from one step to the next step to the next step. One of the things that I appreciate about what you've been doing recently is that you've been going deep with all of your relationships. But one thing that I think that you're still working on right now, and I appreciate as well, is that your your demographic is moving from your regionalized realtor base, uh, and you're going much more nationally. You have Dan Bahi, uh, Habib coming on. You have a, a few more uh, nationally more well-known people. And I, one thing I, I noticed that uh, you one of the people that you interviewed recently actually is your own a daughter as you're talking about your fiscal literacy series. Yep, did and that today. I, yeah. And I, I, I saw that and I appreciate that because not only are you expanding nationally, but you're also expanding out in your audience as well. And and that and the audience that you're speaking to is not just the realtors and not just national audience and loan officers and, and maybe C-suite executives and so on and so forth. But you're expanding your entire demographic. And as and I don't know if you've reached the sixth degree of Kevin Bacon or the sixth degree of separation from one person to another yet. But the expansion and the model of of who your demographic is, it there is no there is no boundary, but there also uh, is a common thread that you have through everything, creating that d degree that you're moving from step to step. Um, do you have a map of how you're doing that, or are you kind of winging it, or do you think that 
uh, you'd like to go from, hey, this is our regional basis. This is our national basis. These are the demographics that we're working on right now. Do you know uh, what what is your actual ultimate goal for maybe not just your fiscal literacy series, but also your 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 generation of business series as well? Do you have like that common goal of where you're headed toward for each series? Well, yes and no. So so I will say that a lot of what I do or have done is is pretty organic in that it has developed what it's just been over time. And, and I think, you know, and I've I talk to agents about this stuff, too, a lot of times because I really what I focus all of my business on, whether it be my clients that are borrowing money or whether it be um, my realtors that are you know trying to do marketing better is I try to I'm an educator by 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 nature. Like I grew up, I ran a swim school for kids for, uh, for 10 years in my twenties. Um, we had 2000 kids. I, I managed at 24 years old. I was managing 15 employees or 20 employees with 2000 kids at a swim school, teaching swim lessons. Um, I've coached both of my kids from the time they were three years old until basically they went to high school in every single sport. I had, you know, two basketball teams, two baseball teams, two football teams, even kids that weren't mine that were on the team that I was coaching because I enjoy it. So like, that's part of a passion of mine is, is when I learn, and I don't claim to know everything. It's just like, when I learn something, I want to, I honestly, it's part of the education process. And you know, any, you read any psychology book or anything that'll tell you when the way you learn is, you know, you, you take in information, you see it, you read it, you, you speak it, but then teaching it to somebody else helps solidify that knowledge base so much better. So, so when I look at my podcast, I look at it from an education platform where I learned this thing that I've found out about and I want to tell you about it because it's going to help me learn better. So, so that's always been my approach in everything that I've done. Now, what path I go down and, and who I'm talking to in my audience, it started from, this is my business. I need to talk to realtors. That's who I'm going towards. But when I look at the real estate environment today and I see all the lawsuits happening and I see home affordability being the lowest that it's ever, one of the lowest levels it's ever been. And I, I was actually in a, not a tweeting argument yesterday, but I was, I was going back and forth on Twitter because I had a couple of guys that were like, Hey, in the eighties, affordability was worse based on this graph. And I'm like, okay, I agree with that. However, back then one income could support a household. Okay. And, and the reason home affordability was where it was, was because of interest rates, because interest rates were 18 to 20%. Okay. Well, today interest rates are seven, which seven's not that bad. When you look at historically, it's not, but back then the median home price was $90,000. And today it's $450,000 or 420 or whatever it is right now. So, so it's a different thing and it's not getting better. Back then, I feel like you could see a light to say, okay, we'll build more housing. Rates are going to come down. You know, incomes are still pretty good. Like we're going to be fine. But now if you want to support a family of four, okay, you have to have a two income household and sometimes a three income household because you have people working multiple jobs. And I've been speaking on this a lot in, in my market updates about how these jobs reports have been completely BS because they're showing that we're adding jobs, but we've added We've lost full-time jobs to a dramatic effect over the last six months, 12 months, and we've added a ton of part-time jobs. So that just means that people are having to work more at more jobs just to survive, right? So if home affordability is getting out of hand and rates are still relatively reasonable, where's the end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel? Because, you know, we've, we rent our cars, we rent our media, we rent our phones. We want their, they, whoever they are are trying to push us into this world. We rent our houses too. So that's a real concern for me when I'm a mortgage lender and my wife is a realtor. So we are, we make our entire life in this real estate business. And from my point of view, looking at it, watching this, I see that industry just contracting and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And is it going to go away? No, people are always going to buy and sell homes to some extent, but with the advent of technology and with all the the threats of lawsuits and everything that are coming into our industry, I really feel like that you're not you're certainly not going to be able to make the same amount of money that you made over the last 20 years in real estate, whether your title in you know uh, mortgages, whatever. And the as technology becomes more and more impactful, the the compensation for the human is going to shrink. So I look at that landscape and I go, all right. I'm not going to get out of mortgages. My wife's not going to step, stop selling real estate, but we have to figure out what's our path to try to support our family, right? So if I like talking to people, I like having the show. So I got to say, okay, can I build an audience to a point where I can then 
use that and monetize that in, in some other way. What is that way? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But that's kind of where I've started to take it. And so I want to diversify. I'm, I'm the Texas real estate and finance podcast. It's as simple and easy as possible. I talk about real estate, but I also talk about money and everybody likes money. So when I sit down and talk to my daughter about financial education, well, first off, we get to talk and, you know, if you, I don't know if you guys have teenagers, but they don't want to talk to you ever. So this was, you know, like today was a great episode. Like I almost cried, but we were chatting about our, our, what we were doing. And, but that's the, like, we had a real conversation. I love that. So that's like about fourth one. So I don't care if anybody listens to that. I love doing it. That's usually when you get the best, best results is when you don't care. Right. And then it pops, but let's just, um, in mic'd up fashion, let's, talk about what you just said because that's stuff that this show talks about quite a bit um i talked about it when i was on rick rock brock um and the friday podcast friday pro uh broadcasting and jeremy potter's podcast uh, one of the points that my birdie from dc you know was going through different pieces and so 50 percent of all municipalities in our entire country are funded from real estate tax. So the idea that they're going to let this get to a point, I guess you asked what the light of the tunnel is. At some point, they don't want private equity funding the the US government, really. They, you know, at a local level, they want citizens doing it. So I, I think they'll pull back. In the meantime, though, insurance costs is going to be a real thing. And you see starting to see the Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's, you know, longtime partner, he always believed in self-insurance or not getting insurance uh, um, and, and really looking at risk. Uh, we can go right to Mike Zhao here in capital markets. I don't know what your thoughts are, Mike, on this, but, you know, how many people do you actually know that have had a house fire since technology has come out with from fire detectors to just what houses are made of, right? Um do you think like I, I like if if what is it? There's one carrier, Liberty Mutual maybe that is actually just saying we're going to take all five years and recoup it in one. So their premiums are going for people from like thirty eight hundred dollars a year to seventy five hundred dollars, doubling. The rest of them are working over five years to get there, but in five years, all homeowners insurance will essentially be doubled. Somewhere along the line, in order to afford the home you're going to have to start taking the risk that it, pilgrim days, if it burns down, you're, you're going to have to figure out how to restart your life. Really? I, I mean, right. Well, one of the things you got to be able to look at, if you're, if you're, if you're an insurance company, they have what's called actuaries. And what these actuaries do is they take, they take these numbers. They say, well, every seven years, something is going to happen. So for example, like I'm in San Diego, it used to be like every seven years, there was going to be some physical calamity, a fire or some other type of thing. I remember the fires from like 2003 and then 2008, and there hasn't been one. But yet here we have insurance costs skyrocketing uh, to the point to uh, I I know that my insurance costs went from a certain dollar amount and then it went to like uh, and it quadrupled and going from two thousand dollars up to twelve thousand dollars was like holy moly! I got to figure out how to how to how to reduce that cost. I mean. If it just went up, you know, and it has since still gone up since I've gotten a new insurance company, but still that uh, those types of costs uh, are, if I, if I, if I didn't already have other forms of passive income to create uh, the ability to, to accommodate that increase in cost, then I, I'd be in a world of hurt, but I couldn't even imagine what would, ha would it be if you're a W2 employee. One of the things, Mike, I want to be able to touch that, that it might be interesting to you is that. Ever since the invent uh, of our nation, going back a few hundred years, if you if you take thirty year increments, um, there have been multiple quarters of recessionary times, economically speaking, right? And but if you take the last thirty years uh, since night since nineteen uh, since the, the the late eighties, we actually haven't. Even though we had the big uh, the, the SNL crisis in the late eighties, and then we had the subprime crisis in the mid uh, in the early two thousands. We actually haven't experienced as many quarters of loss. It's not like we had the Great Recession and the Dust Bowl era where we had soup lines and so on and so forth. And then we didn't have World War II where there was experienced a tremendous amount of not only economic loss, but also physical loss in, 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 the, in the people. And so we've had multiple generations where we, even though we had uh, two military conflicts, one in the 90s and the early 2000s, 
we really haven't experienced a lot of physical, um, familial, generational, or economic loss in a large period of time. And the result of that, not of not experiencing the multiple economic quarters of loss has given us a loss of financial education. In other words, we don't have, we may have had grandparents that may have experienced loss, but then, but then we had generation X and uh, people born in the seventies and the eighties. And then, you know, we just kind of overspec because we didn't really, you know, we don't have that much loss because all we had was really the Korean Vietnam war loss. Uh, and then in the nineties, we don't really have a lot of loss. And so as a result, our kids don't have that loss. And if you don't have multiple generations or multiple decades of loss, you're not going to, it's really, really challenging to teach financial literacy because there's no reason, right? And so the old, and now we have, you know, and, and social media has actually damaged us to sense, oh yeah, you know, you can house hack your way. You can car hack your way. You can social media hack your way into traditional wealth. It scares me because we haven't really taught our kids on uh, what loss really means because they really haven't experienced it. And you don't count the 92 or like the uh, big short crash as um, or 9-11 or any of those as um, like. It, yeah, well, I mean, if you go back, right, like we have we have our savings rate in M1. And I think that if you uh, if you're looking at the actual demand deposits that's going on right now, yes, we've had increases but we still have the disparity of the haves and have nots. There's a disparity of income that we have. So that's, that's my only pushback when you were saying we haven't had the financial, you know, as many financial crises as we had maybe prior to, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. However, the gap between the haves and the have nots has drastically grown in that period of time. And the people with money and the people with wealth has shrunk. I mean, now don't get me wrong. They have way more, right? The the PPP loans that were given out during uh, COVID was the greatest transfer of wealth from the haves to the have. They everybody wants to talk about the the checks, you know, the the stimmy checks that went out, the twelve hundred dollars that went out two times. That was nothing. The trillions of dollars that went to some helped a lot of small businesses. So I want to be fair, you know, it was, there was benefits to that, but there were a lot of really big companies that got a lot of money that didn't have to pay any of it back. And it did not trickle down as we all know. So, so well, I think that, yes, huh? yeah, exactly. Right. Like that. Yes. There haven't been as many financial crises, but when we measure crisis based on the stock market and only 20% of the population participates in the stock market, I don't think it's as good of a measure of where we are as a society financially as it as it used to be because now we have way more people that are on social social um, programs. We have uh, people that can you know single family households, people not having kids. Our population is declining, whether people realize it or not. Um, all of these things are going to have dramatic impacts on our society going forward. And like I said originally, we don't own like back then you own, you paid cash for your car. You maybe had a 10 year mortgage on your house. You you didn't have credit cards. Maybe you had one. That stuff wasn't there. Now the, the government's in the highest level of debt we've ever been, which is terrifying. Um, we are individually at the highest levels of debt that we've ever carried in our life. So it's like, where does all this go? Yeah, it seems like, OK, everything is fine. But underlying, I don't think it is. And, and that's what concerns me. And, and like the phone, right? It, like. The fact that the phone doesn't count in a mortgage DTI is staggering to me because people could not live without it. It is a a monthly payment that did not exist 20 years ago. I, I think cable is something that you used to, like our family cut cable growing up. It was, it was kind of traumatic, but like we didn't have anything. I could go over other people's houses, but I feel like you can't do that now because you'd be cutting the Wi-Fi, right? Or at least like... You're, you're, you're committed to about $100 a month in Wi-Fi regardless of what class you are because you need it for so much. Those two alone already make it a different society than what you're saying is... Um, Our insurance. Look at how much... In Texas, insurance premiums have gone up 60% in the last five years across the board. 60%. That's insane. And, and oh, by the way, in case you guys didn't know, this year, right? I did, I did this in my market update yesterday. Um... We are experiencing the highest temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. And I don't want the climate change. I don't, I don't get into all that. But the temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean are the highest they've been since 2005. And they're higher by, by a pretty substantial margin than they were in 2005. Well, you know what happened in 2005? Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Wilma. Those were some of the most damaging weather events that we've, that we've had happen in our country in the last 30 years. 
And now with the cost of everything being what it is to go through, because now these billion dollar weather events used to be, you know, isolated to hurricanes on a particular coast. Well, now because everything's so much more damn expensive, a billion dollar weather event could be a tornado that rips through, uh, you know, two towns in Kansas. Okay. So, so you take that. We just had hurricane, uh, Bly, Blyle, Bly, that hit on the Texas coast. I have friends that their houses were flooded. You know, there's neighborhoods that are torn down and it was a category one, but it was the earliest hurricane that has been a category four that formed out in the Gulf that's occurred in history. It occurred in January 28th. The last time was when Hurricane Katrina formed, or excuse me, Hurricane Dennis in 2005, it was a category four and it formed in July 8th. So we're earlier, the temperatures are hotter and they're expecting this year to be the worst hurricane season. I hope it changes, but right now they're expecting it to be worse than it was in 2005, which was one of the worst. So talk about insurance premiums, they're not coming down anytime soon. And I think these topics, people are looking for an outlet to get this information. And that's why, you know, bigger picture, there is a huge vacuum for loan officers to come in and create a podcast and they're coming off of a big time where they were really successful. Um, and so it might've been harder to, cause it, right before you jumped on Mike, Mike and I were talking where this journey, like many, and I couldn't think of the perfect analogy, but once you get past like your 10th episode, and you're in a groove of consistency, then somewhere along the line, there's no, no predictable metric, but people start coming up to you and saying, hey, you know, your show's great. You, you got to keep it up. And, the, and it just feels good. And you're like, oh, I guess it's, it's finally clicking. And I think we want to encourage, if we can have some sort of onboarding or help or, you know, message us, anybody here. But I think loan officers need to understand that yeah, at first you're not going to get that pop in vanity metrics, and that's not what it's about. It's it's really about getting started and staying consistent. That's the magic. Well, and I would say too for your for your audience, right? Because you guys are talking to you know, like you said, C-suite level executives, right? If you're running a mortgage company, if you're running a uh, real estate company, right, and this is what you're doing. These are the things that you need to be focusing on, right? These are the type of, you know, it's the days of I'm going to put a, in, a infographic up on Facebook that says, you know, VA loans are going to serve. You. Okay. Nobody cares about that. What they want is they want information. They want knowledge. They want education. So you can, you can push that down to the lower level. You can push it to your loan officer. You can push it to your real and say, Hey, you guys got to do this because it's important or you can run your company and say, we're going to make this a priority. So I'm going to identify my loan officers. I'm going to identify my realtors and I'm going to say, Hey, I need you guys. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you resources. I'm going to give you editing tools. I'm going to give you this because if I can create a platform that's geared around my company, I work for Geneva financial. So if Geneva financial says, Hey, Mike's our, our mouthpiece for this type of stuff, or, or, you know, what Quicken has five or six people that talk, that's where you're going to start pushing the, the next generation of marketing that's out there. Because if you look, just look at the presidential race, right? A guy like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., okay? Previously, prior to the per first last five or 10 years, if you wanted to get a guy like that out there, aside from his name being Kennedy, all right, he had to go on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, all those big networks, ABC, CBS, in order to get himself out there, okay? Well, he's not doing that. He's going to the All In podcast. He's going to Lex Friedman. He's going to Joe Rogan. He's going to all these... He's going to podcasts that have an audience of 20,000 people, an audience of million people, and he's talking to them because he's reaching people where they are, and it's another avenue to get to clients. So if you want to reach clients, if you want to reach the buyer, if you want to reach the, the borrower, then you have to get to where they are, and social media is there, but you got to get where their news sources are and how they get. It's no different than putting an ad in a newspaper, and so if I were running a Fortune 500 mortgage company, I would go find these people within my organization that have the personality, that have the chops, and whether it be podcasts or reels or, you know, uh, whatever, at man on the street interviewing people, asking them funny questions about real estate or whatever, I would focus on that and get into that guerrilla marketing on a low level and get people out there on the street talking to, talking to, to people. Yeah, what he's doing is basically what you're actually similar to what you're doing for your podcast right now, right? Six degrees of separation. So he's just at top, he's not, He's not throwing out birds to out in the park saying, come vote for me. He's going out to the masses and saying, this is my demographic that needs to vote for me. These are the voters and this is who I'm reaching out to. And this is who I want to vote for me. So that's who I'm going to reach out to. 
And by the way, it's super cost effective. Okay. You know, if, if you were going to go spend an, ad, you know, $2 million on an ad that run on, that runs on Fox or runs on CBS, if I'm quick in and I'm going to advertise in the Super Bowl, okay, that's fine. I can do that, which by the way, don't, I hate quick. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is if, if you're going to be that company, then why would you not save money? Right. Because you're not spending and just get granular and have your marketing department go, how do we get to these individuals that we can have that closer relationship with through the podcast, through the video, through the funny TikToks, whatever, you, whatever route you decide you want to go, how do we, or through the blogs, through the articles that we write that are really in depth and, and, and come from a person and not from a company, because in real estate, especially you guys know this, an individual borrower, a borrower uses a realtor that they know and that they're, com or excuse me, a buyer or a seller uses a realtor, a human that they know and are comfortable with and have a relationship with then that realtor refers that borrower in most cases to a lender that they know and they feel comfortable with. So it's all a relationship. It's not, I'm a realtor and I see Bank of America commercials every day, so I'm gonna send my people to Bank of America, okay? Or Quicken or whatever. I'm gonna send them to Mike or I'm gonna send them to Sally or I'm gonna send them to whoever because I like them and I have that relationship. Well, if you can go into your individual communities into your markets and say, okay, in our Dallas market, we're going to have this person in our Houston market. We're going to have this person in our San Diego market. We're going to have this person and spend less time and money on big scope things and focus on little pieces and build a process around that. I think those companies are going to be the one that have the most success going into the future. If they decide to, to, to make that effort to do that and get away from their traditional marketing that we've seen for the last 20 years. Yeah, I, I, what I know, what, one of the things I, I'd like to say that I appreciate about what you're saying right now is you're renewing, every time you get on the air, you're renewing your bonding to your audience. Even if you don't see them one-to-one, -one, th this is where uh, you're doing something that you didn't think that you were doing. You, don't, you, know, you, you said in the early part of our podcast that, hey, I don't like speaking to the masses. I want to go deep one-to-one. -one. But actually through your podcast, you're speaking to the masses, but you're renewing your bond with them by speaking to them. And that renewing of that bonding still allows you to go out to the mass audience while while when you are speaking one-on-one -on -one to your guests, whether it's your daughter like this morning or whether it's to your roofer at the beginning or whether to your other agents, you're, they're getting to know you in the renewed bonding with each individual want person. And then when in the masses, when they get to speak to you, you get to renew to them on a mass basis. And that's what the difference is in marketing right now between, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go do my telemarketing, my email, and my whatever XYZ campaign one to one versus the podcast that we're doing right now is we're getting out to our audience. They may not be able to get our phone calls or LinkedIn messages or Facebook messages, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever, so on, uh, on an individual basis, the one off. But through this mass media exchange, they get to hear, grow with us. And at the same time, we get to grow individually when we do get to speak to, uh, like when we have our our conversation right now that we'll get to grow with each other and get to know each other on a deeper level right now, Mike. And I think that um, for our listeners that are out there that want to get onto a podcast or go deeper with their client base, whether it's a voter or whether it's a, a referral source or an individual client, getting the consistency of doing this type of marketing and doing the consistency of asking the right questions um, get and then going deep with who, who we are as people helps us in the way that we're accommodating our business or or the people that we're doing business with. So it's I'm in deep appreciation for what of renewing that bonding process. Well, it doesn't have to be, by the way, it doesn't have to be podcast. In 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 because again, going back to what I said earlier, when it comes to marketing of any kind, do what you like to do and do it consistent that you'll do consistently and focus on that. But I will say the thing about podcasts and the reason, and I, and I use, you know, everybody uses Joe Rogan is because he's the, you know, the, the biggest podcaster on the planet. But the reason I got into that, and he says this a lot on his show is he says, when I sit down one-on-one -on -one and I talk to this scientist or this MMA fighter or this comedian or whoever it is. Okay. And you're listening. It's like, you're a part of that conversation. You're sitting in a room with those two people. You can't ask questions. It's frustrating. Cause you're like, Oh, don't you, why would you say that? But but you're in that room having that conversation. And then I relate that to, and I don't know about you guys, you tell me, but growing up as a kid, okay, I sat around the the Thanksgiving dinner table or we, my family had Sunday dinners, you know, every Sunday together, like my extended aunts, uncles, cousins, whatever. 
And I was one of the oldest young uh, of the kids. And so as a kid, I had to sit at the adult table because there wasn't a kid table. And my parents would talk with my aunts and uncles and grandparents would talk about politics. They talk about religion. They talk about, they didn't really talk about money, but they would talk about all that kind of stuff. And I was, I didn't have a choice because back then I didn't have playstations and all that stuff. So I was sitting there, but I gained an appreciation for the art of conversation. And when you're sitting in that room and those are the things that I remember as a kid. And when you go to your Thanksgiving dinner, you go to your family gathering, the, the thing that we all walk away with that we enjoy the most wasn't the food. It was the game we all played together in the living room when we play categories or when, you know, when, when aunt Joe told us about her, her boyfriend and what that's the stuff that you remember. And that's what the podcast platform is. It's that intimate conversation that two people are having that you get to be a part of an experience that I think that all humans it just in our nature, we love that stuff. Yeah. And as you say that, um, my parents are immigrants and my wife is an immigrant. Uh, from another country, and so we talk about money because uh, my parents talked to me about money, right? We talk about we talk about budgets, we talk about financial education, and then we talk about this is the type of uh, income that you want: passive income, active income, and you know, balancing the, the the checkbook and things like that. We talk about these things at the dinner table, and then uh, and also on game night, writing out contracts to ourselves and making promises of accountability, because um because because my wife is an immigrant came uh, came from. Uh, uh, a little bit background about her is that she came from a wartime country where there was there was a lot of, uh, of, of <laughs> there was a lot of death and so on and so forth. Anyway, my point and, and then my parents came from that just after World War II. So I think that um, when we come from that, when we talk about financial literacy through game night and so on and so forth, um, maybe our kids don't talk about that. Just like in your family, you didn't because maybe um, maybe your parents were in in a war. As I don't know your your family background, but I think that it's these types of backgrounds at. Um, that they migrate and they um, and they just develop and they mature, and I think that when we have and when we have these types of relationships in marketing at the same time, we mature in our marketing based upon what we know. If we don't come from that lead environment, where, because I don't like getting, I don't, I ne- when I purchased leads, I was just so bad at it, and I just couldn't figure out why. And that was because I like going just like just like you. I like going deep with the people that I work with and the people that I like talking to. And so as a result, you know, guess what? You're doing a podcast. I'm doing a podcast because we like talking, we like educating, and we like doing things to uh, foster, encourage, uplift the people that we are around. In the final five minutes here, I think we have some, some great people up here to help motivate people to get started. So if you're watching and you're a loan officer, be the leader at your company, and really follow the blueprint of podcasting for the first year and then getting on other people's podcasts for year two is the answer for you. Um, along the way, AI is going to come along and, and really help you with the getting ready for the podcast and following up. On that note, Mike, what um, I guess how can they find your podcast? But what would you give, and assuming today's tech stack is available back then for the, for the sake of this role play, for the mic that was first starting again, just because that's what where most people are, what would be like your three-step or five-step kind of granular way that they shouldn't overlook um, as far as microphones, like setting, starting on, you know, what Google or YouTube, or they start here, do they do it on camera? Um, do they need uh, show notes? Do they need to comment other places? Do they need a co-host? What, what would you say that you've noticed for that person that just um keeps saying it every year that they're going to start a podcast so that's the key right there number one do it just do it whether you do it on your phone whether you sit in your car and and ramble on for 15 minutes about something that you were thinking about that you want to talk about or if you have a mic and you want to set or a camera and you want to set your phone up on a tripod and record you don't need a mic you don't need everything that you need is right here okay is it the best is it great no 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 but it's it's all right here okay so start there. Just do it. Do one. It, put it out there. Don't put it out there. Practice one time, whatever, but do it and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. Okay. Now what you'll find is once you do it a few times, that's when you start to refine what it is you're going to do. All right. That's when you start to say, okay, now I'm going to use this. And I'm going to use this. And I'm going to use this. And that's exactly 
what my adventure was like. The very first time I did it, it was with my phone on a tripod in an empty room, sitting on a chair, talking to somebody else. I didn't have mics. I didn't have special cameras. I didn't have anything. That's all it was. Okay. I did. That was probably the first five that I did was just on my phone. So, um, I published them. I put them out. You know, I didn't know much about editing. I didn't know anything. I just was like, but you start to figure it out. Now that being the most important thing of all things, do it, start, do it and do it consistently, do it three or four times before you start thinking about or planning or buying or doing any of that other crap. Okay. Cause I'm the most guilty person of that. I'm going to start working out. So I'm going to go buy workout clothes. I'm going to buy weights. I'm going to go buy a treadmill. I'm going to do all, and then you don't ever get on the thing and do it. So, so just do it. Right. Number one, number two. Now, if you want to get into what do you need to have, let's, let's say we go from just doing it to now you want to, you're in, and I have a friend of mine that I've helped with this and you're ready to go full board. Okay. Well, the number one thing is a microphone. Okay. Sound. Um, I, I read this one time. I've seen it multiple times, but Netflix, for example, when you have broadband issues at your house and your feed slows down, your internet slows down or you start having issues, the first thing Netflix will pull back in order to keep the stream going is video. So your video will pixelate. It'll go from HD to standard or whatever. Okay. It doesn't look good. That goes away. What they don't kill is audio. And the reason for that is because they've learned that, that people walk, even watching a video, they will stick with it if they can continue to hear you and hear it because they, they assume it's going to come back. It's like when we're here and we have internet issues, if you freeze or whatever, but you can still hear what you're saying, people will hang in there. Okay. But if your audio goes away, then they're out. So if, if I, the first thing I would invest in is a decent microphone, whether it be something that connects to your phone or you have wireless ones, and there's a ton of great ones out there. Exactly. All right. That's number one. Number two is when you start moving is okay. Now get it now to get a good camera. Okay. But I don't even think, I think your phone is a really good camera. You don't necessarily have to have one, but like, I just have a regular HD camera that I bought on Amazon. I think it was like a hundred bucks, 50 bucks. It wasn't anything like super fancy. I've got two of them. So if I have a guest, I can turn my screen around and we can talk and do whatever. Um, then once you get to a point where you're recording on a regular basis, the key to getting it out there is you have to have a publishing platform. So the one that I use is called Captivate. There's a bunch of different ones out there. Um, I can't think of all the names off the top of my head, but if you just go look for podcast publishing, um, audio is great to put them on that they're primarily audio based. If you want to do a YouTube podcast, you can do that too. And it's all video and, and audio together. Um, but YouTube's a great outlet to do it that way. I just chose the, the audio platform because I listen to audio on Spotify and Apple myself. That's where I listen to most of my podcasts. Um, but you need to get that. And they have all kinds of bells and whistles and, and you'll go through, I'll tell you, I had a, so when I first started, I, um, I was like, all right, now I got to start publishing this thing more and getting it out there. Cause I was just putting it out myself. So I found a guy online cause, Oh, by the way, if you start doing a podcast, every person from every country in the world is going to email you and text you and tell you how they're going to make your uh, podcast amazing. Um, so I found a dude and he was like, I'll publish this for you. And he charged me, I think he was charging me like 200 bucks a month or something to publish it out there. And I would send him one episode because I didn't know. I was like, okay, fine. So I sent him my stuff. He put it out. I would create like descriptions and stuff when I put it on YouTube. And so I started seeing he was publishing and putting them out there and it wasn't you know, I'm, I, I'm a big, I want to learn how this stuff works so I can know the value that I'm paying for. So I was paying him money to do it. And then I started looking at my captivate site and it really just wasn't as robust as I thought it should have been. And, and once I start, you know, cause once you get into it, you start reading, I listen to podcasts about podcasts and how to podcast. So I started getting more and more knowledge. And so I went on my captivate site and I started looking at, okay, what do I have to do to publish it? And I just, all right, you got to upload your audio. You got to create a title. You got to create a description. You got to create a thumbnail, all this kind of stuff. And I went and did one one day. The first time I did it, because I was just like, let me just try to do it myself. It took me about an hour because I was trying to figure it out. Now I can publish it onto my Captivate website in five minutes. I do it just all by myself. Okay. Now I've created a process to it a little bit. I've got some steps that I do every single time that, that, that handle that. So, so you can do it yourself. It's really not that hard. There's a learning curve, just like with all things, you're going to have to learn how to do it a little bit. You can Google it, YouTube and all that stuff, but you'll figure it out. Um, then next level is, okay, now I need like a website. So the next thing that happened to me that, that, that blew my mind was the website. So there's a, there's a company I use It's called pod page. I think I told you about it, Michael. Um, I love them. They're awesome. Um, it's, it was the, the, I got the, like, we have the best it now, by the way from your recommendation. So it, collaboration is so important. Hope our listeners are out there. This is how you get started. You listen to these steps and, and the page is awesome, by the way. 
it is. And I got the best version. It was 300 bucks. I think they have one that's like a hundred dollars a year, by the way, $300 for the whole year. So it, it was fantastic. You know, once you go in there, you'll see, I had my episodes on Captivate. It was like, what's your feed? I typed it in or copied and pasted or whatever. And it just created my site in like three seconds. Awesome. It gives you SEO tools so you can put in keywords, which is something I was like, how do I learn how to do this? Where's this? Whatever. Okay. So Captivate, pod page, then Canva, because you got to create thumbnails. Very easy to do. You can create templates. They have them. Just Google podcast template and put pictures in and create titles. Super easy. And then the thing that has changed my entire podcast game. Okay. Tune in Chat next TV. week for more to, to for Mike Dopp to hear what has changed the game. No, I'm just kidding. K keep going. The, the audience is loving this. Chat GPT. Okay. So, um, uh, I have, uh, I 